For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. They did not need for God. 
They did not want for God. They had an infighting. And Paul was praying for them a very bold prayer that Christ would come and live in them. Christ would come and change them. Just like with our spouses or sometimes that unexpected live-in person. When someone comes to live with you, it changes everything, doesn't it? It did. And we can laugh about it, but it does. Suddenly, the way that we make our bed is different. The way that we cook may be different. Or the way the lawn is mowed may be different. It changes things about us. Or if you have somebody who's going to stay with you for a couple of months, suddenly your routine is off. You start to feel anxious because life is just different. Or that person snores really loud or eats really loud or any other of our complaints. We have these irritations. And too often we're afraid of the irritations that actually letting God into our hearts is going to cause, so we keep God at a distance. And that's what the Ephesians did. They kept God at a distance, and Paul's prayer was that that would not be the case anymore. Paul's prayer was that they would so let God into them, that the Spirit would take over in an indwelling of the heart, that they would be so transformed that people would know there was something different. It was a change. In Paul's prayer, he talks about giving thanks to God for what God has done for us. But through what God has done for us, God has given us a pattern of how we are to live. That pattern of prayer, that pattern of forgiveness, that pattern of reconciliation, the pattern of love, the pattern of grace. These are all things we are called to. To quote George Stroop, he says this, what brings the writer to his knees, because Paul talks about people of faith going to their knees. It's not just that we get on our knees for the sake of getting on our knees. It is being so in awe of God and God's wisdom, God's plan, so in awe of the creator that we are driven to our knees in pure (coughs) awe. And we recognize that it doesn't matter what level of intellect we have, how much education we gain, how smart we are, how many years of experience we have. Nothing we have measures up to God's wisdom. And we come to kneel before God in awe. What brings the writer to his knees, specifically Paul, is the mystery of God. The mystery of God's will. The mystery that in Christ Jesus there is now peace between God and those previously estranged. You know, when we realize we've truly been forgiven for something, that's that's a big emotional moment for any of us. Especially if we've carried around guilt and shame and hurt for years and years. When we carry these things around, it starts to eat at us. It starts to hurt our physical body. And we start to feel sick. And then, you know, like when we've told a lie, or we know we've done something wrong to harm someone. And, and that conscience starts to work on us. That Holy Spirit starts to stir in us. And that moment that we release it and just say, look, this is what I did, or this is who I am, or this is the mistake that I made, and then somebody says, I forgave you, or I love you anyway, that sense of, oh, thank you. And the tears that flow, the emotions that flow, those are the feelings that drive you to your knees, and the awe of the writer that drove the writer to his knees was the awe that knew that God, through God's infinite love, a love we cannot describe, define, explain, or begin to understand. It is a love that has reconciled people to God. It is a love that has said, I know that you were far from me, but I have claimed you as mine. It is the kind of love that gives us hope for those in our lives who we wonder. Do they ask for forgiveness? Do they know Jesus? It's a kind of mystery, the kind of awe that 
that God could love far beyond us. A peace between us. We live in a world that's so us versus them. Y'all know that. That even happens here in the church, believe it or not. Nobody believed that, did they? And we pick sides. And we fail to stop and look somebody in the eyes and go, God loves you. You are a member of God's family. What am I doing? Why am I talking to you like this? Why am I treating you like this? What? And that's Christ indwelling in our hearts that would call us to that reality, call us to that sense of awareness that we can have peace between us now through the power of God and we will open the door and let God in. And let's not be fooled. A little toe step in here. But just because we come to church doesn't mean we've let God in. And some of us have let God in, and God is sleeping on that couch in the basement. That's about as far as God has made it. We can come to church for years and have a head knowledge of God, an appreciation for God here. But it's what happens here. Paul would be so bold to pray that the people before him would know the indwelling of Christ that would move and would change everything. And his prayer was not, again I reiterate, not that they would be strengthened in themselves, but that they would be strengthened in God. Even in the end of his prayer, he says, Now to God, who by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. How many things have come across your path this week or the last month where you said, That's impossible. That will never happen. I didn't see that happening. I've heard it in these walls. And here, the prayer was not, I don't see it happening. The prayer was, now to God, who by the power at work within us, when Christ is in us, it is a power that is unmatched by anything in this world. We believe in that. If we are rooted and grounded in that love, then everything flows from that. That God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than anything we can ask or imagine. We don't yet even know what to ask God for that God already knows we need. Isn't that awesome? I am glad that God already knows what I need before I've asked for it. Because once I figure it out, then my pride gets in the way, and then it might take me a while to even get to asking for it. And I know I'm not the only one, but I'll be bold enough to admit it. To God be glory in the church. Not to any pastor or any person. And what's interesting is in the beginning of the prayer, he prays that we would understand the power and love of God that the saints know. Who are the saints? Sometimes we say the saints are those who've gone on. Brothers and sisters, please understand that you are a saint. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> if you have Christ in your heart, if you have accepted the love that Jesus has for you, and you have let him in, and you've got Jesus somewhere other than that basement couch, you are a saint. The knowledge of the saints means that which we know that surpasses our mental knowledge, what we hold in our hearts. Again. I can't explain it. I don't know how I know these things. I just hear. I know that God is in control. Here I know that God is good. Even in the desert, even in the wilderness. Here I know that God can do more than me, so I'm going to rely on that. That is a head knowledge of the world can't grasp, right? Because it's here. And those who have Christ living in them are called saints. May we have the strength of the saints. So let me read the scripture to you one more time. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. That's each of us. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant that you 
may be strengthened in your inner being. Not here. Here. Strengthened in your inner being with power through God's Spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Planted in a fruit-bearing soil. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints. That's a knowledge that is basically, we know that we don't know. How freeing is that? I know that I don't know. But I do know that God is good. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Meaning there is no measurement that God cannot go. There is no way to limit God's love, no matter how many times the us versus them mentality tries to pick out, well, God won't love them or doesn't love that. We just, we don't understand how big God's love is. I was convinced, still in some days, that I am my parents' favorite. I cannot comprehend that they could possibly love two of us. At the very least, they cannot love us the same amount. And why wouldn't they love me? Mars the firstborn, I'm cuter. <laughs> One day my brother's going to visit and he's going to have a message of his own. But <laughs> when we're young and we're kids, we can't imagine that. When we're young and we're kids, our parents tell us, I love you so much. You know, Aiden says to me, Mom, I love you more. And I said, you don't get it. You don't get it. And he says, I do. And I said, no, you don't. I didn't get it until I had you. You don't get it. There is a kind of love that you experience as a parent, any kind of parent, biological, adopted, fostered. I mean, there's just this love that you get, it, and, and it's beyond description. You know what I mean? If somebody asks you to define how much, what that feeling is, that feeling of love you have for your kids, can you pen that out? There are not words. Why then can we think we can define God's love for us? We simply cannot. We don't know. We don't get it, and we never will, just how much God loves us. My grandfather, my strong German grandfather, tells me frequently, you just don't get it, do you? And I think that sometimes God says, you just don't get it, do you? I love you. Yeah, just the way you are right now. And I always have, and I always will. And nothing that the world tells you will separate that is ever true. Because I love you beyond what the world can understand. So now to God, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to God be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus to all generations. To God be the glory. Does, he, does Jesus get the couch? Is Jesus in the door? I end with this story, and it's a little difficult to hear, but it is about a woman named Anne Lamont, who is a Christian writer and author. And she talks about a time in her life when she is as far from the church as she chose to be. She didn't trust it. She didn't trust a single person in the church. And she had her reasons. In fact, she was quite angry at the church. She partied. She lived a different lifestyle. She was promiscuous, and she ended up pregnant one day. And she didn't know what to do other than he was married. She didn't see a life with him, and she wasn't ready to be a mother. And so she took a different route. A couple days later, she would be hemorrhaging, and she'd be on the verge of death. And someone would come into her room and she describes it as this amazing entrance of a peace that she never knew before. That despite all of the hurt and broken pieces, all of the difficulties that were going on, that she knew without a shadow of a doubt that that was God. And that God called to her in the depth of her soul, the depth of her heart, and put a message in her that she would come to understand more deeply and profoundly as she would walk her Christian journey, but that she was loved. 
yes, even her. Someone the world had labeled as trash and no good and discarded and unworthy. She knew without a shadow of a doubt she was anything but those things. She knew that she was loved and she was worthy and that she was forgiven for that which she needed to be forgiven for. And in that moment, she invited God in. She'd never done that before. And she said, I invited God in and I let God into that my heart. And God took a hold of my heart in a brand new way. And I experienced the indwelling of Christ. And I clung to the indwelling of Christ every day for the rest of my life. And it's transformed her. And her story has gone on, not to shame or guilt anyone, but to say all of us are members of the family of God. And yes, you are worthy. And you are lovable, even in our most difficult states. And my, the reason why I share that with you is because Paul prayed for all of us. And we all have stories. We all have skeletons. We all have shame and guilt we carry in our hearts. We all have ugly parts to us. We were born with the ability to choose how we want to live and how we want to talk about people, how we want to be, how we want to be remembered. We can be the kind of people that Ralston wants to look up to and emulate. Or we can be the kind of people that he grows up and becomes an adult and goes, why in the world did anybody ever ask me to act like an adult? <laughs> You know, we get older and we're like, these adults do not have it together. We can be the kind of people that keep the doors open so that no one feels like they can't come and find God and, and experience that indwelling in Christ. Who are we going to be? How are we going to talk? When we really let Christ in right there, the head seat of the table in our house, and we let Christ steer where we're going. We begin to live the Christian life we are called to. It is a life called to love and serve. That is it. Not to condemn, not to hurt, not to break more pieces. To heal. We are to be healers. Servers. Lovers. Givers. So, when we think about Christian patterns, Christ-like patterns, Christ would dig in the darkest places of the world and pull people out. He dug into the darkness of an alley when I was face down in it, in the water and in all the gunk that was in an alleyway. And he pulled me out. He put me here. I still don't know why. But I don't ask questions. <laughs> he wants to dig in those dark places. To pull you out. To hold you. Like every child deserves to be held. And to look you in the eyes and tell you you matter. And you're loved. That is who our Christ is. So we shall be like him. That is my prayer for you. For all of us. Let us pray. Almighty God. Remind us. Of your height. And your width and your depth, and your breath, that we cannot, cannot comprehend how much you love us. But we can be thankful. We can rejoice that your love and your grace has saved us. We can open the door and let you in. We can serve you. We can make you ruler of our hearts. That's all you've ever wanted. Root us and ground us in you and you alone. And may the fruit of our labor, the service of our hands, go to help people.